Uh, we're now going to briefly um, go into a, uh, uh, an artist who uh, self-published, or a writer who self-published a book in 1855. It was entitled The Leaves of Grass. And this isn't an, an area that I normally go to, but considering the audience, I thought it was, was worthwhile. With the, with the notable exception of Walt, uh, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, most of Walt Whitman's contemporaries found the, his book, Leaves of Grass, quite impossible to read. But by the early 20th century, uh, appreciate, appreciation for Whitman had grown so much that one author was able to write, quote, uh, though we may not, like Whitman, make the emotions the center of our religion, important concept, we no longer think it necessary to decry a poet who does. And, and, and this, it gets better. And more recently, one of the preeminent American scholars of the humanities, Professor uh, Harold Bloom of Yale, could write in 2005, mind you, Walt Whitman in Leaves of Grass became the crucial celebrant of what I think, yet we will call the American religion. These books are written 50 years apart, and I just happened to, and I said, wait a minute, there's something going on here. In fact, in fact, Bloom adds, uh, a century and a half later from its written, when it was written, it's the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet contributed. Now that's a pretty bold claim. So accordingly, I have uh, selected exclusively for your listening pleasure several lines and only several of the leaves of grass. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, this work is frequently perceived by some as obscure, but don't worry, because I am going to offer translations for each passage. <laughs> Not now, Cato. <laughs> Uh, professor uh, Prendergast uh, is a former uh, professor of English at, uh, at the University of uh, State University of Florida. What the hell was the campus? Anyway, somewhere somewhere west of here. <laughs> All right, song of myself. This is the 1892 version. Walt Whitman, section one. I celebrate myself and I sing myself and what I assume you shall assume. In other words, hey man. I'm cool, just as I am, and I'm going to flaunt it, and you're going to follow my example of tripping out on your own mind or on wine or poetry or drug, sex, rock and roll, video games, or virtue as you please. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. I don't have to work at understanding life. I just look inward. Creeds and schools in abeyance. We don't need no education. We don't need no thought control. Section two. A little more, just a little more. We, we shall no longer take things at second or third hand. You, in other words, you don't have to listen to others to know what you need to know. Nor look through the eyes of the dead. You won't learn anything worthwhile from history. Nor feed on the specters in books. Experts and educators don't know Jack. <laughs> Couple more. I, I guess this is so much fun. Thank you. I don't on myself and there is a lot of me that is all so luscious. In other words, don't tell me I can't be driving too slow in the fast lane because I'm sending text messages. I'm special, damn it. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm gonna, now we're gonna, I'm going to pull back from the humor. Thank you for the, for the laughter. And, and just three, three quick lines. Through me, forbidden voices. Voices indecent. By me, clarified and transfigured. Divine am I, inside and out. The supernatural of no account, myself waiting my time to be one of the supremes. And lastly, I, and maybe most importantly, I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yap over the roofs of the world.
which leads me right into the last person. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next, uh, the next selection, written uh, by a young guy uh, in eight, uh, 1997, 1999 time frame. Uh, it's entitled Thoughts. And, and bear with me here. Know what's weird? Everyone knows everyone. I swear like I'm an outcast and everyone is conspiring against me. Check it out. This isn't good, but I need to write, so here. Within the known limits of time, within the conceived boundaries of space, the average human thinks these are the settings of existence. Yet I, who is more mentally open to anything, see three dimensions, time, space, and thought. Thought is the most powerful thing that exists. Anything conceivable can be produced. Anything and everything is possible. Dark, light, God, Lucifer, hell, good, bad. Yes, the everlasting contrast. Since existence has known, the fight between good and evil has continued. Obviously, this fight can never end. I think too much. I understand. I am God compared to some of these unexistable brainless zombies. I understand the everything. I am the God of everything. This is probably my last entry. The writer of that was Dylan Klebold, who with Eric Harris killed 12 students and one faculty member on April 20th, 1999 at Columbine High School. And the, the, the spooky thing for me is I was doing, I had prepared this for this first show, and then the tragedy in, in South Florida happened. And, uh, and, uh, and I, uh, in fact, I read, through the, I read through the timeline of that, uh, that event uh, in, in Columbine, and it, that, they started at 8, 11, 17, and, and I'm not going to get into the, the discussion of what's important, but it seems to me that the, there's an elephant in the living room, and it, it's not what it is everyone's talking about. It's something else. I don't have the fix, but, 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 but I actually, I do have the fix. Uh, well, but of course, why would I be standing here? Um, um, and, and again, it goes back to this, this guy, uh, this guy Winters, the same first book I mentioned about. He, he said that of those three types of poetry, the, 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 uh, Hedonistic, the ones that gives you pleasure, the didactic, the ones that teach you, and the romanticism, he said, none of them are any good. There needs to be a new form of poetry, which he says, for lack of a better word, we're going to call moralism. Now, I'm sorry, but guess what the live bard does? This is why I started doing this, is because I wanted to do my own stuff. And some of you have heard this next poem, but I'm going I'm to let you have it again. But think about this one. It's called Ten Feet High. When we were kids, Leo was our hero. He would shoot baskets for hours in the alley behind his parents' garage. You'd get a pound, you could hear his pounding dribble a block away. We'd get our ball and walk over and ask meekly if we could share the cart. Even, uh, Leo always said yes, even though he was on his high school team and had to practice every day, even in the snow. We kids would play 21, shooting from set positions, each progressively farther from the net. Leo would continue his solo game, shooting and dribbling from all over the court. I don't think we knew back then that the rim of the net was exactly 10 feet off the ground. The one thing we did know was we wanted to strive to shoot and move just as well as Leo. Today, hoops are mounted on adjustable poles, an insidious egalitarianism, posing as benevolence. It's symptomatic of our enervated culture that now Everyone can dunk the ball, and heroes are passe. Yeah. Yeah. That's called Ten Feet High. And that, that, that I wrote a long time ago. That's in my first book, and I know most of you have got, the, a lot of you have got the book, and thank you. And, and of course, if you know any other people that don't like poetry, you could send them a book of poetry. I mean, if you want to get even with them. <laughs>